Hello and namaste everyone. Today I am here, your host uh, Vinay Kanduri, with this special episode of NBP Hot Seat. With us we have Mr. G R C Nivasan, who has got a very successful career in nuclear sector. He is former director of projects NBCIL, former vice chairman AERP, and ex nuclear business advisor to GMR Infrastructure. Recently he authored a book on nuclear powers, the global energy transition, global and nuclear uh, and Indian nuclear scenarios, uh, which was released by Mr. B.C. Pater, Chairman and Managing Director, NPCIL. Today, our topic of discussion with him will be SMR technology and business potential, trends and commercialization approaches in Indian nuclear market. Mr. Srinivasan, pleasure to have you on this show. And we will welcome you, sir, on this episode of NVP Hot Seat. Thank you, Vinay, and uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I'll try to do my best. The time is very short, and uh, Vinay and uh, me will try to cooperate. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So, uh, as we are discussing about your book on energy transition, could you please uh, briefly take us through the highlights and key takeaways of your book, sir? Yes, Vinay. First, uh, I am thankful to Dr. Chidambaram who has written the foreword. The book is good reading for all stakeholders of the nuclear industry, namely designers, owners, utilities, builders, manufacturers, EPC contractors, operators, decommissioners, regulators, newcomers to the industry, policy makers, public students. It may cater also for global leadership because it has got a lot of takeaways for them. I would like to also mention it has 900 pages. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, sir, wonderful. So uh, SMR has been uh, widely mentioned in your book, right? Uh, so what is the significance of uh, this SMR technology for India and its industrial development, particularly when energy transition is also on the priority list of the government? For India, and in fact, for the whole world, SMRs are vital for climate change mitigation. As you all know, energy transition requires massive decontamination. While it is easy to decontaminate uh, power sources by just substituting the fossil fuel plants by one of the two green energy sources, nuclear or renewable, it is the remaining but it's only 75%, uh, 50, 25%. It's the remaining 75% which is tough. And in fact, this 75% includes some hard to decarbonate industries. And it is here the SMRs will play a vital role. Now, uh, coming to Indian uh, industrial development, it has got conflicting requirements with respect to energy. And as you all know, energy is a very, very important input to development. First of all, India has signed the nationally determined contribution, which calls for phasing out coal by 2070 through appropriate energy transmission plants. The challenge of powering the world's fastest growing economy. Then India would like to give power that also affordable and clean power as per Sustainable Development Goal 7 to all its people. In fact, developing countries like India would like to concentrate on SDG 7, whereas developed countries would like the world to concentrate on SDG 13 on climate change. Nuclear, big and small reactors, is a unique source in the sense it can satisfy all of the above three rather conflicting requirements simultaneously. Quite insightful, quite insightful. So, uh, uh, as you mentioned, SMRs are now gaining, you know, center stage as key enabler for energy transition, not just in India, but globally. And India being a developing economy and decarbonizing at the same time is uh, sort of, you know, drawing a lot of uh, uh, demand for uh, clean energy. So, what is your assessment about possible roadmap for SMR program? and uh, its business potential and trends uh, in the country. Vinay, SMR rose from the ocean. 
right from 1950 in the naval sector, SMRs have been operating. The design of these SMRs is basically similar to the present SMRs that are proposed. Hence, they are safe, they are proven, they are reliable. As far as safety is concerned, they are almost equal to generation four reactors. SMRs depend on physics rather than engineering for safety. There are more than 30 advantages. It's no time to quote all of them, but I would like to quote some important ones. As I mentioned earlier, decarbonizing non-grid CO2 emitters, just transition, SMRs are ideal distribution energy sources. They're so suitable for small countries. For example, having an install capacity of less than 1000 megawatts. And also many countries cannot afford a big reactor. And also they want the power fast. SMRs have multiple uses. Due to all these, SMRs will lead the renaissance. This renaissance, I would like to point out, is much bigger than the earlier renaissance for many reasons. Now we have to build 40 reactors per year as against 17 earlier. With respect to the domestic and foreign business, there is a huge potential. And the domestic side, we're going to build 8 to 10 SMRs per year. There will be localization, as I will be explaining later. Energy is a multiplier, and then we'll have a big business potential due to this. For foreigners too, there'll be a big business I'll be explaining later, and also the roadmap and trends because it will come up again later. So you, uh, when you are quoting these figures, for example, eight to ten SMRs per uh, per year, so you are basically uh, uh, sort of you know telling about Indian nuclear market, if I'm not wrong, sir. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Fantastic. You're right. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. The end is uh, just, uh, you know, uh, just for the benefit of viewers, could you please uh, explain, you know, what timeline do you foresee uh, for the first SMR hitting the ground in India? And what challenges and policy interventions and remedies yeah. are to be rolled out, you know, for a successful SMR? Let me cover uh, globally as well as in India. Yeah, absolutely. In US, they say that the first Arab summer will come online mm -hmm. on 2029. NTPC says it will have 2000 megawatts by 2032, including an SMR. Probably China and Russia may bring it out earlier. But I have a feeling, which I'll be explaining later, that SMRs and advanced reactor need to be advanced. Mm -hmm. The world cannot wait. I don't want people to say that we're trying to solve a 20th century problem in 21st century with a 22nd century solution. In addition, the SMRs need to be initiated better than the recent ones which you are aware of, Minai. And at the same time, well-founded so that subsequent reactors and new builds can be in, built in a sustained manner globally. There are challenges in the areas of industry, regulation, policy, market, infrastructure. We have to do many things which we have never done before. The challenges are many, but I would like to point out some important ones. Standardization of SMRs, reform in the regulatory system, including harmonizing regulation, these SMRs are innovative and cannot be licensed as per the current standards. We have to do faster licensing. And in this context, I would like to point out that the concurrent regulation practice that's being followed in India by the Atomic Energy Regulatory Board is the answer globally to be followed in principle by many other regulatory bodies. The regulatory bodies need to become bolder because SMRs will be located in urban areas and the emergency planning zone need to be pruned. There are supply chain issues, human resource. In India, it takes eight years to license a ship charge engineer. If SMRs are built in three years, five years before they have to start the efforts on human resource. 
there are operability issues. SMRs need to adapt what the world needs for climate change. We have to get optimum grid mix, including facilitating hybrid operation of nuclear with renewable. There are public acceptance issues. Perfect, sir. Of course, so uh, there are challenges, but there are solutions as well. Very interesting. Uh, now, uh, India has identified SMR technology adoption with the global collaboration uh, as one of the you know most suited approach for early deployment of SMRs in the country. So what is your advice for the global SMR companies uh, that are interested to get into the Indian market? Yeah. Now, coming back to your last remark, there are solutions for each of these, but due to lack yes. of time, I won't be able to do. But yeah. in earlier presentations, in many other places, I have given the solutions for this. Mm -hmm. Now, coming to uh, your next question, India is resourceful as well as a huge market. Yes. India is a producer as well as a consumer. Five years from now, I have a feeling that we'll be spending 30,000 crores per year and SMRs will garner quite a few fraction of this. For import, I feel that we should have a different model, a three-step model, starting with a well-planned localization, followed by bidding jointly in third countries, and thirdly, absorb the technology and export. I also feel, in fact, in the present context of Westinghouse and the EPR, that we should not bother about the cost of the first few units. It gets amortized. The supplier, the foreign supplier has to use Indian advantages, which are many and which I have listed them. I want to tell the foreigners, it's a win-win situation for them, as well as the Indian people. For example, if they make the equipment in India, it will be 30% cheaper and they can bid competitively in the international market. In addition, there are many countries in the world who have only designers and operating staff. Nobody to build, nobody to manufacture. And they will be only happy to outsource these things to India. Perfect, perfect, sir. Worth noting. Uh, so uh, as the country is building up its uh, you know, SMR ecosystem, what is your assessment on the private participation and decentralization strategy for SMR program? Uh, wherein corporates and uh, state uh, GENCOs and DISCOMs can also participate in as a uh, utility player to build SMR projects. And uh, what are the likely uh, companies that you uh, consider uh, will, uh, will make the early entries in, in this market? Thank you. First, I would like to point out the vital role that has already been played in the last five decades by private players. They are there in all the fields except in the owner development area, which is what we are now trying to also add on. I was chairman of a FIKI report, which was submitted to the Department of Atomic Energy. The report brings many, many important things, including 26% minority share to 100% roadmap, it has got many models for privatization, including uh, advantages of PPP model. It lists 17 competencies that need to be developed by private players to handle a nuclear industry. And I'd like to point out that nuclear is unique in the sense accident anywhere is accident everywhere. Not geographically, but public acceptance wise, we've seen after each of the three accidents, the growth retarded. Hence, all these new companies need to be handheld by DAE, at least in the initial period. The Nuclear Safety Regulatory Authority bill needs to be passed if privatization comes into play. I have a feeling that we have to ultimately amend the Liability Act. The likely companies, NTPC is already in it almost, Gencoms and Discoms, as you mentioned, have a high potential to participate, but they need to be made bankable by reforms. Companies with fossil plants are very suitable for many, many reasons. One is 
the site for a shattered coal plant is ideally suited for SMRs. Then we can do repurposing of the coal plant, which will reduce the cost of the SMR by 30 to 35 percent. It results in just reduction. I would like to point out energy transition is not just technical. It is emotional. It involves reskilling and reshaping of economy. If you use the manpower and equipment of the existing coal plants goes a long way in achieving this just transition. Thank you very much. Thank you so uh, for your uh, uh, you know such a clear thoughts. And uh, uh, you know though each sector has its own peculiarity, but uh, decentralization and privatization, as you also mentioned, play a very crucial role. Uh, you know in uh, expanding any any sector and we have seen that uh, you know this, that kind of phenomena in the expansion and growth phenomenal growth of uh, uh, solar sector so same kind of uh, thing can be replicated uh, in the new uh, in the nuclear sector and to build up uh, nuclear capacity in the country and uh, then sir coming to our uh, next question i would like to ask you that smrs uh, have also very uh, you, plays a very important role in non-electric uh, uh, sectors also. For example, hydrogen production and uh, industrial uh, heating and district cooling, etc. And you, you have also mentioned in your initial thought that, you know, uh, when we are talking about uh, this uh, energy transition and decarbonization, it's not just uh, electricity, just one uh, portion of that, but then overall, uh, when we consider our overall energy uh, sector, you know there there is you know lot uh, under the under this uh, iceberg. So uh, and in a uh, recently released outcome document of G20 Energy uh, Ministers uh, meeting, uh, they have clearly identified nuclear and SMR to play a vital role in energy transition. So what is your assessment on which type of uh, Indian companies would be or should be looking for SMRs? Uh, to uh, as as a as a captive power plant uh, for their uh, clean energy requirement and for their industrial uh, to meet their industrial requirements. Yeah, uh, as I mentioned earlier, energy transition involves massive decarbonization. SMRs, including molten salt reactor and high temperature gas cooled reactors are vital for decarbonizing uh, non-electric sectors. Hydrogen is a game changer, the wonderful carrier. <laughs> India has also got a national hydrogen mission. I am very glad to see Tata's and JRW are trying to do an experiment of introducing hydrogen in the blast furnace in their steel factories. There are hard to decarbonize steel, chemical, petrochemical industries. Mining of one ton of lithium gives out 15 tons of CO2 if it is powered by fossil fuel plants. It is transportation, it is district heating, it is desalination, data centers, EV charging stations. I am really happy that Purdue University in US is considering a captive SMR to give power to its campus. All the above which I have listed would need SMR as their captive power units. In fact, non-nuclear companies like Dow Chemical, ArcelorMittal are investing in natrium and other reactors so that they can have these reactors as captive power units in their factories. Fantastic, yeah. fantastic. And uh, perhaps it's a very appropriate time for Indian companies to come and incorporate nuclear as an essential element of their decarbonization strategy. And at the same time, uh, as you were mentioning about uh, India's uh, hydrogen mission, perhaps, you know, the definition they are using for green hydrogen uh, or, you know, the kind of policy intervention that they are making uh, or trying to make up for uh, uh, sort of, you know, uh, bringing growth uh, in the green uh, hydrogen sector, but the definition they are using is quite narrow in the sense that they are just focusing on the renewables. And uh, without uh, nuclear, perhaps, uh, you know, we may not 
we 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 will not achieve the kind of uh, you know the decarbonization objective that we are having your thoughts if you can uh, share yeah. some thoughts on that yes vinay uh, i agree totally with all your comments thank you so much uh, so uh, before we uh, wrap up uh, what will be your final word regarding new priority areas for nuclear sector in general and smrs in particular yeah uh, i want to recapitulate again on the energy scenario uh, from which of course the future nuclear plant will emanate uh, as i mentioned earlier we have to power the world's fastest economy and all uh, all of us know that development would require energy for example if you have a percentage gdp growth with some elasticity the percentage power growth will be determined the minister has already told we must generate 9% nuclear by 1947 human development index of 0.9 requires 5000 kilowatt per hour per capita we talked about energy transition and our ndc in all these there will be vital role played especially by smrs now i suggest we go for four streams in future and sooner or later all of them on fleet mode first the 700 megawatt indus i have coined the word indus for indian phws as against can do yeah. imported lwrs and i'd like to mention i think vvrs are ready for fleet mode operation fbrs because they use thorium and india not using thorium is like arab countries not using oil and smrs both imported and indigenous we must also develop indian breeder molten salt reactor as well as compact high temperature reactor the work on which is already on hand and both need to be made modular soon and in fact also we must develop uh, accelerated driven system so that we can use the thorium which we have in all these reactors we must establish a circular economy we should tackle the supply chain issues and epc issues we should have regulatory readiness for this and we need five times the present resources of men material and money of course there are avenues for finding such things but it requires a lot of planning there should be more efficient progress than what it is now and better funding i think we should have our own taxonomy environmental societal societal governance and green bond and all of these must include nuclear in their protocol then there is fdi there is boot there is psu is a private industry which all can do the funding in this context i want i was very much impressed by the rab model of uk which is risk share risk sharing yes. and will be good in the process of privatization government funding is required for r and d i think the present funding is not adequate for the mission mode in which we are going to go in future in nuclear the funding needs to be increased because there are some areas of r and d which only government funding can can satisfy at the same time in addition to receiver the receivers of this fund need to be more efficient need to speed up the present progress is too slow and the india and the world cannot wait we have a tremendous export potential i would think that we can part modularize our indus or phwr so that we can build it in 4 years we must develop fast our own lwr of 900 megawatts considering the international market in fact smr development should be on top priority because there is a tremendous international market 4 to 5 years from now uh, surprising countries like african countries yes. middle east are all going to smrs and they need it now 
there is a situation which I'd like to point out in the end, which is very, very tricky situation. On one side, we have SMRs and nuclear power. On the other side, for the 75% decarbonization, we have so many other things which I mentioned, including steel plants, uh, petrochemical plants. These two industries are never having a platform common to them until now. They are operating isolated. And we want to consider them to couple with each other. Each of them have to adopt to each other. In addition, if you are going for coal repurposing, the coal plant and the nuclear plant to adopt so that many of them can be used, including even turbine generator. I don't think we can leave it to for themselves to do this because there have never been a common platform in it. I'm happy there are some task forces set by steel industry for this, but it's not enough. I think we must have a high level standing committee for energy transition, which will have tremendous power of laying out the plans, monitoring the process, taking corrective actions. And hence, it's going to be an area which requires tremendous in, uh, inputs. Otherwise, the 75% decarbonization will simply not take place. Uh, thank you again. I need three hours for this. But I've I understand. I understand. I understand. I understand. You have got. I am ready. I am ready for one to one reaction with anybody. Wonderful, sir. Wonderful. I mean, the, the quite insightful, uh, uh, you know, arguments you have made regarding this uh, SMR technology and the business uh, potential that is it has got. And you have really coined some of very interesting words, induce, and <laughs> and then you have touched upon REV model for financing. So these are really very interesting points that can take a nuclear sector to the next level. And perhaps, you know, the kind of uh, uh, industry, uh, is steel and then petrochemicals and all, they are quite, you know, big in their size and volume. So perhaps, you know, perhaps the nuclear stakeholders can also take some initiative on their part and reach out to these industries and help out them to in an attempt to help out them in their uh, decarbonization uh, initiatives. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, one comment, it's already happening, Vinay. Uh, I told you about the uh, steel industry trying to use hydrogen. Abroad, the chemical industries are trying to see whether they, they can use the process heat at less than 900 degrees. Okay. Uh, because the high tem highest temperature uh, that can be attained by HDGR is 900 degrees. Right now, process heat is much, much more than 900. But I know, I am aware of some chemical industries abroad, in, especially in the U.S., trying to modify. So it, ha it takes two hands to clap. And yes. I think both need to adopt to each other. Great, great, great insight, sir. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Srinivasan, for such an interesting conversation and putting across your thoughts and your insights so clearly. Uh, so viewers, with this, we would like to wind up this episode of NBP Hot Seat. For any questions or queries for Mr. Srinivasan or for NBP, please drop in your message in the comment section below. Uh, we will get, get back to you as soon as possible. And also stay tuned for our upcoming annual India Nuclear Conference, INBP 2023, which is scheduled to be held in Mumbai on 10th and 11th of October. So with this, we are signing off. Bye-bye. Have a nice day. Bye, everybody, and thank you.